to welcome you to this very special um, conversation, uh, Tropic Chat 20s, a series of conversations with key filmmakers and film professionals. And as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of Cinema Tropical, and we have a, um, a great guest uh, to, um, this evening. Uh, big I'm a big fan of her work. Uh, she's a big, uh, influential, and trail and trailblazing uh, filmmaker. Um, and it's a great honor to 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 um, to have her with us. Um, Lourdes Portillo uh, was born in Chihuahua. She moved to LA when she was 13. Um, and over 40 years, uh, she's made um, um, 17 films chronicling chronicling the Latin American, the Mexican, the Chicano experiences, as well as ju social justice issues. She was nominated for an Academy Award and an Emmy Award for her 1986 documentary film, Las Madres, the Mothers of Plaza de Mayo. Other key, key titles in her filmography include La Ofrenda, The Days of the Dead from 19, 1988, Columbus on Trial from 1992, The Devil Never Sleeps from 1994, Corpus, A Home Movie for Selena, 1999, Señorita Extraviada, uh, Missing Young Woman uh, from 2001. And actually, we're also celebrating the 20th anniversary of that film, and we'll be talking about it. And Al Masaya from 2008. Her work has been screened at some of the most prestigious film festivals and institutions around the world, including um, the Toronto Film Festival, Sundance, New Directors New Films, the Venice Biennale, the Whitney Museum, the Guggenheim Museum, and she has been recipient of the Rockefeller Foundation Fellowships, uh, Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, and multiple grants from the National Endowment for the Arts. She has been honored with over 10 career retrospectives, including, uh, including at the Pacific Film Archives in California and the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and as well as in the Cineteca Nacional in Mexico City. In 2017, she received the IDA Career Achievement Award. And I can continue um, enlisting her uh, list of accolades, but uh, um, but otherwise we'll run out of time. So please welcome Lourdes Portillo. Lourdes, great pleasure to have you with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And great to celebrating uh, with you 20 years of Cinema Tropical and 20 years of uh, uh, Señorita Extraviada. Uh, it's a nice coincidence. Yes. It's a, well, it's amazing. Time flies, you know? And things, in a way, remain the same. <laughs> you know, the same things are still happening in Mexico and uh, all over Latin America. But I think that's good to mark the time. It's good to remember, and it's good to not forget. Yeah. Yeah. Despite that, the contexts are difficult. I mean, there's still a lot, a lot of great things to celebrate. So this is, you know, this is what we want to do. And so before we start, um, we just want to play the trailer of uh, Señorita Extraviada um, for people who haven't seen it yet. It's a must see, so uh, <laughs> you should go and see it. Um, let's, let's, let's watch the trailer. to Juarez to track down ghosts and to listen to the mystery that surrounds them. Carlos, ¿puedes hablar? Nada más. Mm -hmm. na, eh, di algo y ya. Okay. So, okay. So, Lourdes, um, I'm, I'm curious about your upbringing. Can you tell us about uh, your upbringing in, in Chihuahua and and that uh, and 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 when you moved to LA at age 13? How how difficult was that um, at that age? It was very exciting, you know, um, and very sad because it was my childhood that I spent in Chihuahua, 
and um, it meant leaving my grandmother, whom I loved very much. So uh, yeah, I thought I was going really, really far, but we didn't go that far when you think about it. I mean, we went from Chihuahua to Mexicali, mm -hmm. you know? So I lived in the border for years as well. And my father had gotten a job in a newspaper called the ABC. And, uh, and my life changed drastically because coming from a, from a city that was very old and very all made out of, um, I don't know what the, the stone is called, cantera, you know? Mm -hmm. It, it's there are these you know these buildings very old buildings so probably from the you know I don't know 200 years ago and also we were living with indigenous people with the Tarahumara Indians you know that came to the city to beg um I, it, it was my childhood I, I remember walking in the streets I remember hearing music I remember all those things, and I had to leave all that behind and go to Mexicali, which was a wild, wild place, mm. you know? And um, it was exciting at the same time, but it was very sad to have left everybody behind. Um, but I think that one of the great things about having my father gotten this job, you know, in the newspaper was that I got to spend a lot of time. We live very close to the newspaper and uh, I got to spend a lot of time in the newspaper. So I saw how a newspaper was being created. You know, there was a redacción, you know, there was uh, the press room, there were the linotypes, you know, the excitement of the of the reporters coming in with their stories and their typewriters. And, you know, it was kind of breathtaking. And- uh, And that had a big influence in your career as well, no? Uh, right. that, that's where from your, your investigative uh, uh, journalist <laughs> angle comes through in your work? That's right, exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. it. I mean, I found it very exciting. And they were always looking either for some criminal behavior or, you know, whatever news, you know, and, but I was aware of them. I would listen, I would, they wouldn't stop talking, you know, if I were, I was there. So I learned a lot and, and it was very exciting. And I thought, wow, you know, this is great. This is great fun. And um, after a few years, my father got another job working at the LA Examiner. That was another, a newspaper. And uh, he said, we're going to move to the United States, you know, where it's going to be better and easier, you know, to educate five kids. We were five kids. And uh, so one good day, my father, you know, took everything we had and put it in a truck and we drove to L.A., mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we landed in L.A. And that was another kind of transition, another very exciting transition, really. In one way, it was very traumatizing because I had never really experienced racism, but I was already 13 years old, you know? So I, I had my wits about me in a way, but uh, that was very damaging, of course, you know, to me and to my brothers and sisters. But at the same time, it was also exciting. Here we were, you know, in Los Angeles where they make the movies of the world, you know? So that other influence of having people be around, you know, us that were making movies kind of made me think, well, it's not an impossibility, you know? If they can do it, you know, I can do it. And so things became more possible. And I think it was also my father's attitude, you know, of you can do it, you can succeed, just keep on going, whatever it was, you know, that he would tell me um, that I was capable of doing was very inspiring. Uh, what, what moment, uh, what moment in, in your life you, it became clear to you that, that that, that making movies was a, was a possibility? I think when I was, uh, when I had uh, finished junior college, 
And there was, um, this was, of course, you know, a long time ago. There was a group of Hollywood uh, writers and directors and, uh, you know, people that worked in Hollywood that gave Chicanos a class in filmmaking. But at the same time, they wanted you to join the Communist Party. <laughs> you know, that was okay with me. I, you know, because <laughs> I had come from, from Mexicali where my father would bring all incredible books and magazines, you know, because of the print, printing business. And I remember reading Soviet life, you know, that would come into, into the newspaper and I'd ended up reading it. So I thought communism was okay because there were these <laughs> great magazines had all these beautiful photographs, you know? So I was very, and my father was also very left leaning in a way, and that's what he taught us. And so I felt that that way of being was okay. It was, there was nothing wrong with it. I mean, you were a more just person or a better person. I, I felt that for some reason and uh, which was true for me. And they introduced me to other people and through them, I met like younger people that were actually going to college to learn to be filmmakers. And they were wonderful. They gave me a job, I was a PA in one film specifically. And uh, it, it, it kind of, enabled me to think of myself as something that I could do like that. And I had loved the movies since I was in Chihuahua, you know, I used to live by the Cine Azteca. I went to the Niños Héroes, you know, I saw Charlie Chaplin. I was a big fan of the movies since I was very young. Mm -hmm. So uh, it all kind of fell into place. So yeah. you had in mind to become a filmmaker when you enrolled at the San Francisco Art Institute? Uh, that, that, that was, you know, I wanted to be a filmmaker, but then I got married and I had three kids. You know, that's another, like another life, you know? <laughs> and um, when we moved to San Francisco and I wanted to be, a, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker and I didn't know how to do it in San Francisco. There was a, it was a different, uh, Ambiente, you know, so totally different, you know, and uh, but I, I, you know, tried to figure out how to do it, and there was an an internship program in a, um, a union for of engineers, you know, uh, people that work in television and stuff. So I joined it, and through them. You know, I got involved with a group of Marxist filmmakers here in San Francisco and uh, and I worked with them for a while, but I couldn't really work a lot with them because I also have my had my family, you know, that I had to take care of and then became problematic and uh, all that stuff. But I continued and then there was one moment when I, I went to hear uh, poetry in North Beach and and I met these poets, you know, that some of them still live here in San Francisco, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And they were very encouraging. And they encouraged me to, to do this. And then I met uh, Nina Serrano, who is a poet also and still alive. And she said, well, let's make a film about Nicaragua because all this was happening in San Francisco. You know, mm -hmm. there were people from Nicaragua, from Argentina, from Peru, from all of Latin America, escaping, you know, the dictatorships. So it, it was a very political time and a very a exciting time. And I just, I just wanted to know how to do this thing, you know, like it was like printing. I want to know how to work the press, you know. So. Um, I tried to see to go to take a class at City College and that wasn't enough for me. And, and then there was the Art Institute. Mm -hmm. And the, the Art Institute was my place because I was, you know, I had freedom with my time. And also it kind of encouraged me to think the way that I think. 
more than you know fit into some kind of mold. So that was so it, it was it was a big influence, uh, it, Mark. It, it was a big influence in your incredible career. influence. Yes, yeah. incredible mm -hmm. influence. And all the artists were very generous and kind and wonderful and encouraging. Mm -hmm. So, boom! I just did it, mm -hmm. you know. And it was under a lot of big sacrifice, but I did it, and and I was very happy to have done it. Yeah. So you already mentioned Nicaragua, and uh, you know. Your first short film has to do with Nicaragua after the earthquake. Exactly. So, um, how was making that first uh, short short film, uh, and also fiction, which also in a fictional format? Well, you know, I was young, and I didn't. I mean, fiction. It seemed to me like that was the thing to do because no one else did anything else. I mean, some of them, the people in the um, collective, did do. You know. Uh, documentaries, but I felt like I didn't have enough experience to do that. So I thought it was easier perhaps to do the fiction, which I did with Nina, who was an actress and a poet. And, you know, so we mm -hmm. collaborated in that and that was, you know, successful in terms of getting the thing done. And we got a grant from the American Film Institute, which was a very encouraging first step amazing you know and uh, and that little film took us to to Poland you know to a film festival in Poland where you know the new Latin American cinema was just booming you know in Latin America and they were all over Eastern Europe you know in the film festivals and and they saw my film they loved it they you know they invited me to go to Cuba they you know, and then we all kind of became one. You know, Did you feel part of a, that new Latin American cinema? Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, that relationship went on till the Senorita Extraviada. You right. know. Yes. And then from this short fiction, you just jump directly to to nonfiction, to the doc, uh, documentary format, which a film is a film that op opened a lot of doors for you. Um, the, yes. um, the Mothers of Plaza de Mayo, uh, which uh, you co-directed with Susana Munoz. Can you t t um, tell about it, how you, from this short, you jumped to, to making this, this film and then? Susana was a student. She had come from Israel, you know, from Bezalel, which was uh, the art school in Jerusalem. And uh, we met at the Art Institute and I was editing something and I had a tango on in the movie Ola and she said, oh, I come from Argentina and the, we became friends, you know, and she told me what was happening in Argentina about the Mother's Plaza de Mayo, not with the intention of making a film, but she was just kind of recounting, you know, the, um, the story. So I listened and I thought, you know, we can make a film about them. Let's do it. You know, this sounds really great. It sounds like a great story, like an amazing story. And she said, okay, well, let's do it. And, and I said, but I don't know how to make a documentary, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and she said, neither do I. You know, we were used to making art films, like scratching on the, you know, on the films or whatever, you know, whatever we were making it. So I said, well, I work, you know, with this collective, Cine Manifest, and I kind of think that we can do it, you know? It was like, we never had a teacher that taught us. So we just learned it, you know, from seeing other films and we developed it in that way together. So it was a very fortuitous kind of meeting between us. And, you know, we, we managed to make a, a documentary, for, you know, from zero, which was really, uh, I can't believe that we were so bold, you know, now that I'm old, <laughs> just, but it worked. It was wonderful. You know, it was great. It was the most amazing adventure, you know, to go to Argentina with the dictatorship still in place for, you know, and trying to film something that was so forbidden and so frightening and so horrendous you know, as what happened in Argentina. And uh, I was uh, 
that film, yes, opened a lot of doors because what happened with this film, it was, you know, it won like, well, never mind. That's not in, interesting. What, what is interesting is that, uh, that we got it made by hook or crook and that, you know, it went on to the Academy Awards and all that. And there, from that moment on, you know, things were much easier for us. Yeah. And then after this film, you em embrace uh, the nonfiction format. Pardon me? I mean, even though you, after this film, you embraced the nonfiction format. Well, I, I didn't Mostly. think, I, you know, I, I never saw like the thing kind of growing. I just mm -hmm. said, well, yeah, we can do something else like this. But, you know, maybe it should be a little different. You know, we were going to make La Ofrenda together. Uh -huh. But we started fighting and it was awful. And she had one vision, I had another. So, you know, in the middle of the shooting, she left and, and I had to take care of it. And I just continued. But, you know, La Ofrenda, I felt, had a lot to do with my culture. And um, I wasn't going to drop it. it. There was no way. We had already got money to do it. And I just continued working on it and trying to figure it out. But I, I wanted to be more experimental. I wanted to be more what I was seeing as my vision. And uh, I tried. And I mean, some of it, you can see it in La Frenda, that there's these things that you know are not necessarily common in documentary. And it happened. And, and also, you know, everybody thought, well, you can't make that film because you just made this really political, you know, uh, firecracker. You know, you're going to switch from one thing to the other. And I said, yeah, you know, I have to. I have to. I can't continue to be making these films like this, sure. you know. So I, I think one key characteristic of your work is basically this playful mixing of the fiction and nonfiction in your work um, to, to different degrees. What's your, what's your personal take on these boundaries uh, between fiction and nonfiction? No, I think everything's possible. You know, again, I came from the Art Institute. We think everything is possible and you can do anything with anything, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and that attitude, I think, is very, very helpful because also it's very much a part of my culture. You know, you make do, you make do, and uh, you see the beauty in everything. And, you know, you don't have to be rigid about things, you know, and you can be playful. And I wanted, and then that's when my personality, my idea of my culture came out, you know, like to be funny, to be mysterious, to be tragic, to all, all those things all the combination of things that we are as human beings should be represented in film. It doesn't necessarily have to be a theatrical feature to, you know, represent every filmmaker. So. I have a quote uh, from the ending of The Devil Never Sleeps. Uh, would you, you close the film saying, hay solamente verdades a medias y tentadoras preguntas. There is a, there are only half truths and tantalizing questions. So basically, that uh, applies to all of your filmography. Uh, what's your take in terms of um, creating a very similitude? Uh, because I, uh, as a programmer, I, I do notice a, a big cultural, a big cultural difference between the U.S. and Mexico in terms of what we take as as fact or or, or what, what we take as truth. The construction of, of that truth, and you know, the U.S. is very factual. Whereas uh, I think Mexico is more about that that the whole narrative uh, rings rings uh, very similar. So I don't know what you're taking in that sense. I think there is so much nuance in human behavior that I think that it, it really takes someone that wants to take it on, you know, to play with that. I mean, after all, film is an art, you know. And that's what you're doing. You're making art, you know, and you're representing art in one way or another. And uh, for it 
to be a, a rigorous, you know, rigid thing, it's not going to work for every culture. Absolutely not. You know, most cultures are not like that. So I wanted to, you know, do this thing, you know, really represent the way that we are, the way that nuance, you know, humor, uh, tragedy and comedy live by side by side. I don't know if that answers your question though. Sure. Okay. The same, the same way another, I think, uh, important characteristic of your work is that you have experimented with different kinds of formats and aesthetics, as, as you were saying, mixing them in very creative ways, uh, which is also kind of a very fashionable these days and you've been doing for, for, for decades. Um, how, do you approach, how do you approach the form in regards to the themes and topics of your film? You know, how, how do you imagine the format when you enter a new project? I think what uh, attracts me to a new project is the story, right? If I can, mm -hmm. I mean, this, my filmmaking has a lot to do with storytelling, you know? If the story, if I can tell you a story and you're interested in it, you know, I'm gonna say, yeah, I mean, you as my friend, not a producer, but, and I see your interest and you wanna know this and that, and you know, and I'll go on with the story. Then I say, that would make a good film. It has an, a beginning, a middle, an end. It has humor, it has tragedy, it has this, it has that, you know? And now that's the first treatment that you do is like really writing the story down as, you know, a storytelling, for example, you know? And from there, then I, and where does it happen? And then it, well, it happens in Chihuahua. Okay, well, this is the setting, you know, and it, it's the elaboration of a film, you know, it goes like stage by stage, you know, that makes me, that attracts me to it more than anything. That's how, that's how I do it, you know, the same with you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, in, in terms of that storytelling, I'm also intrigued about the uh... The use of single personality, how you've uh, used it in many of your works. Uh, when do you decided to use it first, and 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 continue exp um, and continue exp um, exploring on it, uh, even tweaking it in Al Masaya, uh, having 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 your own crew, but with an actor, you know. Uh, but still, it's, it feels like a kind of extension of this single personality. Exactly right. I thought, well, because of my political uh, interest, you know, I think that it's very important, you know, to represent, you know, ourselves as ourselves. I wasn't going to make a film about, you know, another person, you know, that is not a uh, Mexicana, Chicana, whatever you want to call me, you know, and, um, and another person. So uh, it, I figured to have a first person narrative creates, first of all, uh, a body of work and it creates a message. You know, it tells you, this is, this is me, this is my life. And uh, you know, here I am and here we are. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, that the, our representation is being owned by the film. Okay, and that was me, my profound intention. You know, not so much that it would be me, but that it would be the me that, that I represent. Hmm? Because I see that we are not represented. And to this day, still, now, oi, today, we are not represented. You know, we are not given space to be. Despite despite the fact that you opened that door many years ago, uh, you know, it's and I guess that's a, I guess another important question. Uh, for many years and still up to, to these days, it's so difficult for a Latino Latinx filmmaker to make a, a career, to make a second film, third film, you know. It's 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 incredible how you were able to to make a film career, which is 
I'm sure it was very difficult back then. It's still as difficult right now. So I mean, Greg, how, how do you manage to, to, to make a film career? That's interesting because, you know, you asked me that question and I was thinking about it and I've thought about it. Uh, in the last 10 years, I haven't worked a lot because I was sick for a long time. But um, how did I do it? First of all, somebody asked me this, you know, how did you, or was it you that asked me? How, how were you, why were you the producer director? You know, because I had to be. You know, I had to be. I asked many, many producers to please be my producers. And they said, no way. You know, not, not even kindly. It was like, you know, what are you talking about? So um, I said, well, I have to do it. And I'm terrible at that. I'm terrible, terrible, bad. Ask anybody, you know, but I did it. You know, I fundraise, I tried to manage what I could, the money and everything. And one of the things that I did is that I never got paid. You know, that that was the only way I was going to get this body of work done. You know, I wasn't, it wasn't about money for me. It wasn't about money, you know, it's about representation. It's about being, you know, fair with everybody in this country. This country, you know, proposed to be that, proposes to be that, but you know, it really isn't. And so I've worked, you know, to represent. That's what I've done. How do yeah. you balance in that that production, wearing a production a producer hat and a director hat? How do you balance both things? Well, you know, in general, I would say my um, team, whenever I have a, um, a team, we're very few, we're very close, we're very um, badly paid, we have the same vision, you know, we can communicate between us, we love each other, and we're dedicated. That's how it's been done, mm -hmm. you know? with a whole lot of love because uh, there wasn't a lot of money. It's still the same these days, you know, but, but, but it's somehow, you know, though, filmmakers right? are not. Hmm? It's a little different. I see that people are able to get uh, a whole lot of money for a documentary. I mean, the document, the budget of a documentary right now is like, wow, I can't even believe it, you know? but everybody gets paid, you know, everybody earns well, which is fine. I mean, I don't see anything wrong with it, but I think in this, my case, there had to be a sacrifice because there was no, no other way, you know? But now, you know, you can go to Netflix and they'll give you a bunch of money and, and you'll do what they say, right? Yeah, and, and that is a problem, you know, we, we're talking about, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, um, the need for more representation, uh, you know, but but also that representation needs to be also more diverse narratives. It's not only about the people who are telling the stories, but also the different storytellings. And that is what I don't think gets discussed uh, too much. And, and in that sense, I think uh, the documentary world has become even conservative in terms of bending the form, you know, the opposite of what you've been doing for over 40 years. Right, exactly, exactly. I agree. I agree with you. It's, it's a pity, you know, you see one documentary and it looks like all the others, you know? So when you see something different, like a La Gente Topo or something, you know, you mm -hmm. just, it delights you, you know, it delights you because you know that that filmmaker probably did not have an easy time of funding right. her film. No, in that sense, I think uh, you've uh, influenced uh, two great filmmakers that I think been highly influenced by you is Natalia Almada, you know, come on, Fred as well as uh, Rodrigo Reyes also, you know, I think they've been very inspired by, by your work in terms of, you know, bend, bending the rules and pushing the envelope in terms of different types of representation. So yeah. I'm glad there's a, finally, there's like a kind of a generation that's, but but it's still kind of um, not that many filmmakers. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, no, that's not to say that I'm a saint or anything like that, but, you know, I think that we do need to have our, our voices, our, are honest voices out there and, and desperately. That's what I think. Yeah. Um, 
because I think they're starting to make a lot of trash too, you know? Sure. Uh, which led me a little bit to, 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 to my next question. Um, you know, as a trail blazer, you've inserted certain topics and subject matters uh, to, the, to the American mainstream. And, uh, you know, and after you made those films, like there's been other films talking about the, the, the same topics, um, like, you know, um, like the, the Mothers of Plaza de Mayo, uh, The Disappearing Women of Juarez, Narco and Media, uh, Selena. Uh, how do you take it? <laughs> you take it as a compliment? <laughs> so how do you? Well, I'm glad, but I think that I, it would be good for them to go out there and do their own investigations and do and see what it is that they can do. Because what they're doing is they're just kind of, you know, holding on to the coattails of somebody else's, I, not ideas, but thoughts, you know, like, you know, I'm going to, I want to help. I want to help the girls of what is, right? So, uh, and then they say, oh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Let, let's do that, you know? No, take it, see what else you can do. How can you add to that? I mean, there are other artists, other, other artists that do other things that have come to me with other ideas where they go and help the community, where they go and make another movie, but not filmmakers, you know? And I'm sorry, it's just, I, I think that we need to have more originality and, you know, original thinking, strategizing, all kinds of things. I mean, I don't mean to sound like some, you know, sour thing, but you know, that I think we need it as a people, you know, because I think we're, I, I see a lot of films that are repetitive, a lot of films, like now I even see Spanish uh, comedy in, in cable, you know? And uh, I mean, Mexican comedy is so funny to me. Why not them? you know, or okay. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm just a cranky old lady. <laughs> I don't. Now that we're talking about Missing Young Woman and celebrating 20th anniversary, premiered at Toronto in August 2001? Yes, I think so. Like yes, 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 yes. Well. Yeah. Which, by the way, I think I, I told you, but um, I mean, it's also, uh, there's a very direct connection with Cinema Tropical because that was the first film in 2002 that we, that uh, opened the Cinema Tropical series as a national tour, uh, you know, we started in 2001, we're doing um, a monthly screenings, but then uh, with, um, with Senor Textaviada, we were able to create this uh, national tour. So we're also like a, you know, direct link with the, with the film and your work. Um, since we're talking about the film, um, how do you, how do you, how, how, can you tell us about the making of the film? How did you get connected with the story and, and decided to make a film about uh, these, these femicides in, in Ciudad Juarez? Well, I'll make it short. I'll tell you. Um, I, I generally, what I, I used to like to do, I don't do it anymore so much, but I used to do it, was read the newspapers from Ciudad Juarez and from Chihuahua and from Waimas, you know, what, you know, the North. And, and I, it, it's so compelling, it's so beautiful, it's so wonderful to read these stories because you, you're never gonna read them in any other newspaper but that, right? And uh, in one day I read, you know, this, you know, newspaper story that was a little article about this big and it said 50 women have disappeared in Ciudad Juarez and no one knows what happened to them. And I said, well, 50 women, they got lost just like that, you know? And, and also the humor that is in that, I mean, it is horrible, but it's true, you know? The way they talk about it with such naivete, right? You know, you know what happened to them, you know? So uh, I read that and I thought, how could it be that nobody knows what happened to them? You know, I'm going to go back there because my family, part of my family lives there. So I'm going to go visit them. So I, that was the first time I decided that I would make this film. I went and I, and I saw Esther Chavescano who ran a home for, uh, you know, these uh, girls that, you know, it wasn't, everything was very muddled. Everything was muddled, you know? you could get a little bit of truth and then you'd get a long story. And then you had to be able to discern between the truth 
and cover up and all kinds of things. So uh, to me, that was really compelling. And I said, I want to make a film about this. This is, am this is an amazing thing, you know? So immediately, you know, I started fundraising so that I could get my crew that I adore, you know, to come with me, you know, to, to come and go, go into this adventure and see what we came up with. It was never the intention of solving anything because we know that you can't solve a crime like that. It's impossible, you know? But at least to expose it to the light of day is gonna tell everything, right? So uh, that's how I got uh, the story down, you know, interviewing a lot of uh, mothers of the girls, the women, the social workers that work with them, you know, the scholars that work with them, all that. Yeah. How do you, how were you able to, to, to have this testimony? So it's, it's, it's pretty incredible how, you know, many of these um, mothers and, and um, members of the family open up uh, to talk about this, these cases. Uh, was it hard to, to get those testimonies? I don't think, no, 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 it wasn't. No, I mean, I, I don't, because it depends in what spirit you come in and approach them, right? If you say, I want to help you, just talk to me, you know? You don't go in there like uh, an investigative reporter, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and doing all the uh, formalities of being a reporter and then taking off and never seeing them again. I kept on coming back. I kept on coming back. What happened to this one? What happened if this one went there? And that, that you know, we'd follow people back and forth. So that, that was, you know, how that was done. But I don't know if that was your question. Sure, no, not all. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I read in some interviews that uh, you were threatened after the release of a film. <laughs> that's, right. that's right, that's wow. right, that's right. I was threatened and I, I think about it often. I was threatened in the, um, in the police, uh, what is it called? Uh, Donde esta la policía? La comisaría? La, la comisaría. La mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I went there, I went there with uh, different uh, kind of personalities from the United States. They wanted to help Esther Chavezcano again who had, you know, this uh, shelter for women. And, uh, and we were all sitting in, in, in a room and we were talking about these women being disappeared. And um, a man came up to me and he said, I want to talk to you. I said, okay, okay. So I went out to the hallway and he said, uh, he said, you know what? I know where Esmeralda Street is. That's where I live right now, right? Hmm. And I said, you do? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why are you looking for Esmeralda? And he said, uh, well, I know where you live. It's this far from this, from Army Street, and it's like this and like that. And I then I realized that he was threatening me. And uh, I just said, well, you go ahead. You do whatever you need to do, you know, and I'll see you later. But it shook me up, you know? Yeah. It was not even a veiled thread. It was just basically, you know, I know what's happening and, you know, I know everything about you. That was a threat. Was you it, know? was Senorita Sabaya, in this sense, your most challenging film? Also, I mean, I think so. Yes, yes, because I think that uh, you know the people that were committing the crimes were always near me. Hmm. You know, they were around all the time, but they, they, I think, they expected a more aggressive, a different type of a reporter, a different type of you know approach. So they thought, nah, you know, you have to worry about this one. You know, mm -hmm. I hope. That's what they said, but <laughs> <laughs> in any case, yeah, it was very, very scary, and I remained very scared for years, you know, for years, yeah. 
what is crazy, I mean, again, 20 years of a film, uh, longer since these cases started happening. And it's crazy, nobody imagined that things could even get worse and that the femicides would be a problem pretty much all across the country. Well, what I think, Carlos, is not so much that they started spreading, but I think this is what ha has happened. After 20 years, after having done this film, I realized that what has happened is that it's been uncovered. Like during this pandemic, so many things have been uncovered. So what has been uncovered is the fact that women, young indigenous women are murdered kind of a sport, you know? It happened because we were invited to go to Saskatchewan in, in Canada, mm -hmm. where they told similar stories that happened in the reservations of Indian people, you know? And then I realized that this is a tactic that has been used since the colony. This has been going on for 500 years or more. This is nothing new. And when I remember my grandmother saying, you know, we were also afraid when Francisco Villa came into town because he lived there, right? They would rape all the girls, everybody, all the girls. So they'd hide all the girls. In Chihuahua, that's a known fact. Women are hidden when the soldiers come. So it's, it's much bigger than, than Senorita Extraviada. It's only the tip of the iceberg. And I think that's what, what it uh, revealed to a lot of people, that this was happening all over Latin America, you know, everywhere. And then now recently, me cayó el 20, you know, and I realized this is old stuff. You know, this is historically old practice of frightening everybody, you know, just doing whatever. I'm not even going to say because it's so disgusting. True. But I guess, you know, we haven't seen this magnitude at, at least in terms of, you know, right now Mexico is a mess in that sense. Maybe <laughs> many other senses. After Senorita Extraviada, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, a bit later, you, you decided to make a, a very interesting film. I, I really love uh, Al Masaya, which has a much more uh, lighter tone, but it's a very self-reflexive film about filmmaking, documentary filmmaking. Right. And, and also it's ahead of its curve in terms of uh, kind of uh, making fun of poking about the representation of narco in media somehow. Right. And also, I think it was also a way of making fun. I felt like I had gotten like an undue amount of attention, you know, for my work. I felt kind of like uh, a little bit arrogant and I wanted to kind of bust that bubble for myself, <laughs> you know, like the, the vain, you know, filmmaker. And, and uh, Ophelia was so willing to work with me and we had no money. We did that film was made for almost nothing, you know? Yeah, but it's a way of looking at oneself as a filmmaker and, you know, when you let things kind of go to your head, it was just a, a commentary. How do you meet uh, the protagonist, Ophelia Medina, who's a you know, well-known um, actress in Mexico? Oh, well, uh, you know, Ophelia also was part of the new Latin American cinema. You know, this sure. beautiful movement that happened you know, and we all met each other. We all, the people of that age, you know, we, we've known each other. We, we would meet in, in Havana, you know, at the film festival. You know, we became, we all became friends and colleagues and it, it was a, oh, I'm, a ver, lo siento, perdón. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so we, uh, we just became friends. We, we were friends. We, we had everything in common, you know? We wanted, we wanted to change the world for the best. So, you know, we would do things like that. Yeah. And, um, and how about mixing this? When, when, 
because because the film is a it's a it's a mixture between fiction and nonfiction and also plays like a mockumentary. It has has all these different elements to it. How do you um, create the concept for the film for Al Masaya? Well, I figured again, you know, a lot of it had to do with the budget. You know, we can only we only have this time. We only have this little thing. We have that, you know, and and we don't have all these other things. For example, I mean, the crew is the cast. Do you know that? The crew was the cast. There was no one else. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, and that's how we made it. Mm -hmm. We shot ourselves, you know? And uh, that it was just a playful kind of something that I wanted to talk about. Also, because I was really, I had, was coming from Senorita Extraviada, I knew sure. all about, you know, um, narcotics, you know, uh, where they enter in the, in, the, uh, in the country. And that was one of the mm -hmm. places, you know, so I wanted to make that comment, you know, injected into this silly kind of thing that I wanted to do. I'm curious, uh, you know, some of you, you, you shot um, several of your films in Mexico. What is your relationship with your homeland, both personally and uh, professionally? Uh, do you think you, your work has been duly recognized in Mexico as well? Or? I, yes, I do. I, I'm actually, you know, I have an Ariel for Señorita Extraviada, you know, and uh, I have very close ties to the women filmmakers and to some of the men in Mexico. And uh, I feel like I'm a, a part of Mexico in a way in the filmmaking world, a little part, you know, I'm the cousin that moved north, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I love them because they're my people and because they are who they are. And uh, um, I, I, I like that very much. I'm, I'm, I belong. So, uh... So you're you're the key, yeah, yeah. Yeah, We have a couple of questions from the audience. So we can take them there. But actually, we were talking about. I mentioned uh, Rodrigo Reyes. Uh, he's watching, and he says, "What do you think that young filmmakers today should remember or hold on to in their practice?" A little bit more information. I mean, can you elaborate more? <laughs> that meanwhile, we can go to the other question uh, with uh, Claudia Ferman. Uh, have you taught? Uh, she's asking um, if you have taught filmmaking in the past, and are you teaching now? Uh, yes, I've taught. I taught at UC Berkeley, and I taught at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And you enjoy I've teaching taught in different classes in other countries. You know, in Barcelona. Yeah. Right. I have. Is that a part, uh, the part of your work that you? No more. I'm I'm too old. No, no more teaching for me. <laughs> did, you, did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy I teaching? Or was it? I, lo I love it. I love teaching. Yeah, it's wonderful to be with the students. Yes. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And ha have you been um, keeping track of uh, kind of uh, what's been going on in Mexico, Mexican cinema more recently? Have you? I see, I see the things that are done, you know, I haven't seen a lot though that I have to say I used to be, because I also belong to the Academy in Mexico. In the past, I used to watch, you know, all the uh, everything that was nominated for Arieles, you know, in in Mexico, but not anymore. Yeah. But I, I guess I could, again, kind of, they probably have links and stuff where I can watch. That would be great. Before it was DVD, so it was a big deal. Sure. We have a question from Eliane Islas. It's a very um, general question. Uh, what is, do you have any, any, any advice uh, for young filmmakers? Yes, I think I do have advice for filmmakers. Try to do things cheaply, you know, and try to do things that come from your heart and from your culture and don't be afraid don't be afraid that they're not going to uh, understand you ever you know I'm sure you'll make them understand you you know I think we have fears 
that what's going to happen with my movie is not, not going to go anywhere because, you know, it's too strange or something. Doesn't matter. That's, that's exactly what you need to do then. A follow-up question in that sense, because uh, throughout your career, you're, um, you're challenged the expectations and, and, and filmmakers get put a lot of expectations in terms of what, what success is in terms of filmmaking. You know, if you, you get to X festival or you get to X award, you know, that's, that's what's considered successful. But, but you've taken a lot of different risks, you know, like if people are expecting something, something from you and, and you deliver something completely different. How do you, how do you, how do you navigate all this, the expectations that are placed in a filmmaker? I think what happens with a filmmaker is a filmmaker has to be um, to feel confident that their vision is correct for them. You know, that they are, they have something to say that it's, for example, just, just to use an example, that, that it is funny, that it is, you know, wonderful to look at, you know, that it's new. All the things that you want it to be, you have to believe it yourself. First of all, you don't have to convince anybody about that. You know, if you are true to yourself, you know, and you are rigorous in, in your work, it'll, it'll come to be, you know, it'll come to be. I, th I really believe that. And if you have some talent also, that's, that's a given, you know. And how are you, how in, in your perspective or in your work how are you how how do you manage that rigor that you're mentioning having rigor what does it entail in, sort of in general for for the young filmmakers who are listening? Well, I think it, you you have to be rigorous in your vision. You have to know the steps that you have to take and how you're going to take them, and you have to believe in yourself. You know, uh, I think that's probably what I mean by rigor. And um, Rodrigo Reyes uh, just uh, contextualized some a little more of his question. So what do you think that young filmmakers today should remember or hold on into their practice uh, in, terms of, in, in sense of uh, values and ideas, something to help them in their practice to keep their voice, uh, to keep their voice uh, strong and authentic? You see, I, I totally believe in looking inward to yourself and seeing I am this person, you know, for example, I'm, I'm, you know, a certain kind of a person. I am a very moral person, say, for example, you know, and I have to stick to my morality. You know, you have to stick to your principles. And I think that that's really, really important. I, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I come from outer space. I don't know, you know, but uh, it, it, too many compromises, you know, it, it's not good. You know, sometimes you compromise a little bit, maybe not, but uh, for me, I can't compromise. It just has to be the way it has to be. You know, and I also, I think I believe in my vision, you know, and, and believing in your vision, uh, I don't know how other people do it, but I, I think how I came to believe in my vision is, the way that I was brought up and the way I believed in myself or the way somebody believed in me. And uh, it's confidence, that's what it is. How do you, how do, how do you find that validation in yourself? It's, it's hard, uh, it's I, hard because- you know, Yes, it is, yeah. it is it's true, <laughs> it's true. You, you find it, you know, you remember, this is how it works for me. You know, I, I did it's many ways. I'm, I'm, this is, we're really flying by the seat of our pants, like the way they, they say. I think, I think about, I think about my father. I think about my father and I think about my grandmother and I think about the people that believed in me and what did they say to me? You know, like uh, my father, one day he came with a piece of paper and he said, look, this lady just crossed the English Channel in the night. And she was all leathered up with whale blubber, you know. She had just crossed the English Channel. And I was a very good swimmer when I was a kid. So my father said, si ella puede, 
tú puedes. Entonces puedes cruzar el canal. You know? And I think about those little moments of um, inspiration that someone else gave me about me, about my work. And I think that gives you the strength to go on. You know, you have to be grateful for that. Those grateful, grateful actions and those beautiful words that somebody told you that you could do it. I don't know. Thanks so much. Uh, before we sign off, um, you made a short film last year, which I haven't seen actually, State of Grace. Uh, oh, you haven't seen it? Oh my. That, I haven't seen uh, it. Uh, Te la mando. Can you tell us a little bit about, yeah, I'd love to see it. Uh, have you tell us, uh, tell us yes, a little bit about it? Yes, and... yes, yes. After I did Señorita Extraviada, I got very sick with cancer and it was very trying and very difficult for a very long time, 10 years. So, uh, you know, I, I would try to do things, but I couldn't, I didn't have the strength and I couldn't do it. But I decided that I was going to make a film about a, a little dream that I had. I had a little dream and I said, but I can't shoot it. And I, what am I going to do? And I have this uh, very talented uh, nephew-in-law and I asked him if he would do the animation for it. And he said, sure. And we started doing the animation and we did the animation. She did it. I didn't touch it. He did it. He did the animation. First, we did a sample of what the dream was and gave it to him. And then he animated something like it. And, uh, and it took us the longest damn time. Oh my God, it took us a long time. But that, that's the way it was. And it is about a little dream that I had you know, where I saw my mother, my father, and my grandmother coming to me in a dream. And um, my grandmother giving me light, which kind of speaks to what I was just saying about inspiration. And that's what it's about. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing it. <laughs> Well, one other question. So I'm going to cut that for hours, but one other question. I, 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 you know, looking back at your wonderful, your wonderful filmography, are you aware of of all the influence that the, how influential you've been to so many filmmakers? Uh, I'm even thinking. Um, you know, um, I've been thinking a lot about the Devil Never Sleeps in terms of how that film also opened a lot of a very interesting door for for particularly for Latin American filmmakers. Uh, of through the personal exploring, uh, mixing mixing melodrama with uh, with a documentary, with nonfiction, with um, with a kind of a thriller, kind of you know suspense, uh, to delve into into uh, family, uh, political um, history, um, to talk about larger issues. Um, I don't know if if you're aware of all the of, of, of you know the the big influence that you had in in, in so many directors. Well, I'm honored to be an influence. I'm, I'm, yeah, I think um, a lot of the filmmakers have told me that and that has been really kind and I'm very happy, you know, and I'm very proud of having tried so hard so they can try so hard. And so we can leave a mark, you know, all together. I think uh, I thank them for opening their hearts to me. And, 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 and just the last comment. For me, also, what's what's really amazing about all your work is that, you know, basically all of the issues and topics that you were uh, and, and, and forms that you were exploring for you've been exploring for forty years. You know, these boundaries between fiction and nonfiction, gender issues, terms of issues of representations with uh, Latinx communities, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know that that are still in vogue and these days. You were working it forty years ago, <laughs> so. How, how do you see it now that you've been you've been paving that way for for so many years? Uh, well, I, I think I think I have a gift. That's what I think. I think I have a gift, and that gift, and that I was aware of the gift, and I used it. You know hmm. that I, that I could uh, I could kind of tell some things were going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Sure. That's what I felt. I felt like. Yeah, it's, something's going to happen, but something has to be done now. You can't do it later. Everything has to be done now. 
it's strange, but uh, it, it, it's just a kind of a vision, of, not, not a vision in the, in the scary way, but you know, like, you, you know, like the girls, what is, how can it be that 50 girls disappeared? Don't tell me that that, that is so, such BS, you know? They don't disappear. Something happened. Like that, you know? And, uh, or I, I don't know if you ever saw La Ofrenda. Mm -hmm. You did, yes. of course you did. Yes, yes, yes. It was the same with La Ofrenda. You know, La Ofrenda was, I mean, the Day of the Dead was just beginning to be celebrated here in the Galeria de la Raza. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is too touching, too emotional, too personal, too beautiful to be ignored. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't ignore it. So you, you must make a film about that. You know, so you, it's inspiration. <laughs> Cut to 30 something years later, and Disney makes them <laughs> an animated film about Coco. Or, you know, it's. it's, it's... <laughs> I'm sure you have those, many of those stories. Uh, you were certainly ahead of your curve. And in that sense, you know, your, your films are as, time, as, as timely as ever. So for the people watching and haven't seen all of Luda's films, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity to catch up because. Uh, all the films are, are connected to what we, we're living and what's happening right now. Lourdes, a great, great pleasure to No, I'm so grateful for you doing this. It's very wonderful and, um, you know, I'm honored. Thank you, Carlos, for all the work you're doing, you know. Ay, siento, lo siento. No, all, 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 you are all also doing. Huh? All the fans calling. No, hombre, no, no, hacer otra cosa, la policía. Okay. Pero, well, um, we're going to say goodbye to the audience, but we can continue talking just uh, in here. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, and, and, and stay tuned for the for uh, our, our guest uh, filmmakers in the coming weeks. Thank you. Bueno, tú y yo nos vamos a quedar acá platicando. Muchas Órale. gracias. Sí. No, algún día te cuento lo de, lo de ese, del...